Welcome back to the Heavy Metal Mayhem Radio Show. It is January the 21st, 2024. We got a great show for everybody tonight. Steve Mann from Lionheart and the Michael Shanker Group and Erica. The whole band's calling it tonight. It was just supposed to be Erica from Sanhedrin, but the whole band's going to be calling us. So we got Erica, Nathan, and Jeremy. So I'm looking forward to talking to those guys in about a half hour. So right there, we kicked things off with Torch, Beyond the Threshold of Pain. I love those guys, man. When I was able to get Ian Gregg on the show, I think it was like eight years ago for the first time, uh, it was such a thrill because, you know, I go back with these guys from the very beginning in 1980. They actually started around 79 under, under the name Black Widow, but 80 they became Torch. They were just a killer band, but they had a very short lifespan in the 80s. I mean, I think they made it to about 85 or 86. They put out three killer records, you know, the Fire Rays EP, the Torch record, and then the Electric Kiss album, which was the last record with the original lineup, the band broke up, then Dark kind of put it back together in 2009 
with the Dark Center record, re-recorded a lot of the old songs. I think there was one or two originals on there, which really weren't bad. And then after that, he was in the band, out of the band, in the band, out of the band, on and off, you know, after that reunion tour and everything. And then they put out Reignited in 2020. A good record, but not like classic Torch, in my opinion. You know, like I said, it's a good album, but it just doesn't bring back the feeling of those old days. And then Dan was out again, right after the Life Fire was released, the live record. They have a new singer right now. I caught a couple of clips of them on the internet from uh, some of the festivals that they were playing. I can't even pronounce his name. I think it's Lassie. Good Mundison. Uh, he's not bad, but, you know, Dan Dark is really such a voice and such the voice of that band that, you know, I couldn't get into the live songs. But maybe when there's some new music coming out, you know, I feel differently about it. We'll just have to wait and see. All right. Uh, John's in the chat. Eamon's in the chat. All the boys are here tonight. I love it. And thanks for coming, guys, and hanging out. All right, let's get on as many songs as we can before the first interview. Last week, we didn't get a lot of music out. We had a lot of talkative guests last week, and it was a great show. So we kind of lacked in the music department, but we'll try to make it up there tonight, even if you have to run a little later. Uh, how about we do Brand New Sax? I've been playing the hell out of this album all week, man. Hellfire and Damnation, they really blew it out of the park with this one. I mean, sax have never disappointed me. I've been a fan of this since the early 80s, and album after album, they just keep getting better and better. And after all these years, this one's a killer. And, and how can it be uh, Brian Tatler on guitar? I mean, I was wondering how it was going to be if he's involved in the songwriting process. I'm not really sure yet, but I'm pretty sure we're going to have Biff on the show in a couple of weeks. I'm not really sure of the date or time. We're going to work that out, but let's get on some brand new saxon for everybody. How about we do uh, Pirates of the Airways? <laughs>
All right, Hex with Invader. Right before that, Lethal Sin with Destroyer. I can't remember the last time we played them on the show. And we kicked off that set with Saxon. Pirates of the Airwaves. Ah, we're going to get more music on before we talk to uh, Sanhedrin. Uh, Steve Man and me on the second half of the show. Uh, did you see the clip on, uh, on? I think it was on Blabbermouth. I don't go to too often, but, you know, uh, of Paul Diano started like his Australian tour. He looks like he gained about 100 pounds. I mean, from sitting in that wheelchair for two years. He had that leg operation like two years ago. I've had, I've had operations like that, and I was up and walking around within a matter of days. I mean, the guy's still sitting in a wheelchair two years later, putting on weight. He looks horrendous. His voice has been shot for I don't know how many decades now. I mean, he's still out there doing it. Like, he goes from country to country. And he has like these bands for high where local bands learn the music that he has to play and they get up on stage with him. They perform. He was like berating the band, berating the audience, the sound man, anybody you could think of. He had something to say to. And it was just horrible. I mean, it looked like there were maybe 20 people in the, in the club. There might have been more behind the camera. Who knows? But it's just kind of pathetic. I know this is all he can do and this is how he makes what little money he can. Uh, but it's just really sad. I mean,. If you got to be in a wheelchair to play, just stop playing. I mean, at least let me one out on top, you know. <laughs> he died right after playing, but he was still standing up there on the stage as sick as he was. And it's just kind of sickening watching Paul Diana play like that. Ah. All right, Christian wanted to hear Universe, the song Angel. So let's get it on nice and early in the show for him. We always wait till the end because he picks out like 10 minute songs most of the time. <laughs> he gave us a couple of short ones the last few weeks, but there you go, Christian. <laughs>
of which kill a penance for past sins. Kurt Phillips wanted to hear Scythian Woman, so we're going to play that right now, and the band should be calling in right after this song. So here we go. some really good stuff. Okay, we'll just hang around for a minute to wait for the band to call in, and we'll get that interview going. Uh, you know, last year, we really tried to dig deep into the underground and bring on a lot of those bands, and it was kind of like a disaster. <laughs> Most of them really had nothing to say, and it was kind of disappointing. I mean, some of them were really good. Some of them just were kind of bombed out. I couldn't get anybody to talk. You know, we had the Wrath on last year, Orphan Allies, Oblivion Night, Invasion, Black Virgin, Militia, Nick Fury, Max Warrior, Restless. Some of those bands were pretty good, but most of them, it was like pulling teeth trying to get them to talk. And I know they haven't been in music in a long time. They haven't done interviews in a long time. So I kind of get that. But I mean, some of them were just so untalkative. I said, you know what? Maybe we're just going to stick with the professional bands I keep playing all the time and do interviews because, you know, the look at like last week. I mean, we had to end each interview after 45 minutes because we were just running out of time on the show. You have talkative guests that are busy and active, and, you know, that's what happens. So, but I think I'm doing it again this year because I'm going to have Charles uh, play on in about two weeks. Or is it, I think it's next week, actually, we're going to have them on. So, we'll see what happens. Hopefully, they'll break the, the demon bond of not having talkative guests. So, we'll see what happens. Ah. Uh, all right, here. Yeah. Oh, Zebra. You know, I love Zebra from back in the day. Uh, they have a new record coming out next year. They're going on tour. Actually, next year is this year. <laughs> I 
forgot to mention it like a couple of weeks ago, but and I keep forgetting we're 2024 right now. But Zebra hitting the road this year, the touring. They have a brand new record coming out. I saw those guys so many times. Like they're originally from New Orleans, but they were kind of based here in Long Island for many years. I think, I think they're still in this general area, and they're working on a documentary. That was the only good thing, I guess. They came out of Anvil documentary for other bands. Is that it gave them the chance to make a documentary kind of on the cheap, and it brings a lot of attention to the group. I mean, look, it revitalized Anvil's whole career. You know what I mean? They're still playing clubs. They're still out there. They're not headlining shows and arenas and stuff like that, but they're very busy and very active right now. So there's the right one out right now. I think it's a four-part series. I think next week is the last of the four parts. I'm waiting for all of them to be uploaded so I can watch them because I don't like watching one week and then having to go back, wait a week to get the next, you know, you get into it and, like, you want to keep watching it. So... I'll be checking that out. I know there's a lot of documentaries coming out over the next year or so. I got to write them all down, and next week we'll mention them. Some of them actually came out, but you have to pay for them. You know, a lot of ones are just thrown up on YouTube. You can watch them. So, you know, it is what it is. But we'll wait a few more minutes for the bands to call in. What else was there? There was something else I wanted to mention. I just can't remember what the hell it was. I didn't write anything down there. You just, like, scribble a couple of notes about, like, things that were taking place in the news, but I kind of forgot. I just happened to remember, oh, Becky Baldwin is going to be the new play- bass player from Russell Fate. Russell Fate, one of my all-time favorite bands. I mean, probably the number one. Uh, I was crazy about them in the 80s. I didn't care for them when they reunited later on. You know, it just wasn't the same thing. I mean, that classic lineup, and has so many years. I mentioned this all the time. They put it back together, and they kept dilly-dallying, pushing things off. And it wasn't even like King Diamond was so busy, because, you know, he has been, he wasn't doing a lot of anything either. It's only been the last couple of years that he started getting really active again, and then the Merciful Fate reunion. Joey Vera, love him as a bass player, love him with Armour Saint and all the other bands he's in. I didn't really care. I just couldn't see him in Merciful Fate. It just, it, the fit wasn't there for me. Becky came in, and I don't think she did a lot better job. Oh, we got the band call right now, so we'll get back to that. Erica, this is yeah. Mike. You're on air. How are you? Hey, Mike, what's up? This is Erica and Nate from oh, Van Medrin. How you doing? Well, I'm doing How's great. I'm doing great, man. I'm glad you guys are here. I mean, been such a fan for a few years now. I saw you guys playing with Satan in Manhattan some years back, and Man, you won oh, me yeah. over. Uh, that was a great show. Oh, cool. Well, thanks for having us. Uh, it's my pleasure. Us. Yeah, you've, got, you've had a lot of cool bands. Uh, and we try, you know. <laughs> 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 when you're from Brooklyn, you know, the accent gets them drawn into the show. Awesome. Right. <laughs> awesome. But listen, like, I'm such a fan of you guys, and you know, like you know, I keep saying last year, but it's actually a year ago. I keep forgetting we're 2024 right now, so it takes me a little while to get my bearings on the years. As you get older, you kind of forget, you know. But brand new oh, record, okay. you know, oh. with lights on. What a great album that was! And man, I think back to that first record oh, and the progression you, that you guys had over the last seven or eight years. Thanks. Well, we happen to be together at our guitar player's house in northern New York, you should tell them that Frank wants to yeah. go pee. His dog wants to go pee right hey now. But <laughs> we're in the northernmost region of New York State. Like, literally, I bought weed in Canada earlier and did not cross the border because we went through the Aquasasne Reservation. But... That's where Jeremy lives, and that's where we are sort of getting together and completing the next record. So, you still there? Uh, can you hear me? Um, yeah. Okay, yeah, we might have lost it. Yeah, you know, you, you, the internet is horrible. <laughs> it's not like the old yeah. days with a telephone, but I can't believe you guys are working on another record already. I mean, I mean, but, you know, your output, look at it, 2017 with The Funeral for the World, The Prisoner in 19, 22 with Likes On. I mean, that's incredible. You guys are able to put out records that, that quickly. You know, we just do really, we just write songs really good, you know? We put us <laughs> in a room and stuff happens. Yeah, that's I mean, important. we're lucky because at this point we're, like, kind of figuring out a different way of working because of the proximity factor like you know, Jeremy who is the guitar player is about seven hours from where Nate and I live in New York and so this album has been sort of an interesting new approach to songwriting but we're up here we have been rehearsing in this guy's uh Cabin. shed basically <laughs> which has been awesome right but outside it is about 
zero degrees Fahrenheit. Oh, hell yeah. It's colder up there than down here. <laughs> Fucking A, yeah. Is there a song in yeah, there I somewhere about that? <laughs> <laughs> Perhaps. You'll have to wait and see. <laughs> yeah, that might be. Me uh, just happy. Well, you know, considering that he's up there now and the two of you guys are down here and, you know, in the city, I mean, I mean, do you, have, do you prefer to be together in person when you're writing or can you just swap things back and forth? Is it like one person who handles most of the writing, then everybody kind of chips in to put the beats or is it everybody together? So usually um, we'll, we'll send some ideas back and forth and, and it usually starts with a riff or a bunch of riffs uh, that either Jeremy or Erica put together. And then in the past, it had been all of us together in a room. Um, We kind of got a taste of this remote um, songwriting during the pandemic, because at that time, uh, Jeremy was had had moved out west to uh, to deal with some family stuff. So we, you know, we kind of got used to emailing stuff back and forth. And I actually recorded drums with my phone, you know, because all my recording for lights on for lights on Uh, for for the the demo, demo. not the album. So. uh, we, we had a little bit of experience with this. I mean, our, our preference is definitely all three of us being in a room because you can just really quickly kind of figure stuff out. But um, this seems to be working out pretty well, and uh, we're all getting pretty good at our, our mobile recording and uh, uh, file sharing. So, yeah. Well, that's good. I mean, it seems like it's Jeremy's fault. you got to tell him to stop moving around. Uh, well, you know what? He moved home. I mean, he moved back where he went from whence he came. Yeah, he's from up. Yeah, and you can buy a house in this area, like that you can live in. You know, turnkey. Yeah, for sixty grand. I know it's just a long way up the and really cold up there. <laughs> yeah, it's very cold. Very cold. <laughs> that is true. <laughs> I give up after Rockland County. That's as far as you're going to get me before I got put on a jacket. Yeah, I know. I know. Rockland County is, you know, and it can get cold up there, too. Yeah. Uh, well, like, like I was saying earlier, I mean, I'm glad that you guys are working on new music. And kind of going back to the beginning, it's been about, I guess, nine years so far for the band. I mean, were you guys all familiar yeah. with each other before it formed? Or did you kind of, like, run into each other, put this together? Because three-piece band, I think, is the best in my mind. Because everybody's really got to carry their own weight and make things happen. And it's such a big sound for three people. So um, Jeremy and I were in a band together when uh, we were a little younger. I was, we, we met at a bar in Manhattan, and uh, we played in a band together for like two or three years. And concurrently... What year was that? That was, that was probably 2000... I, I couldn't tell you off the top of my head. Seven, eight, nine, in that, in that range. Um, so... We had had a project. It didn't really work out. It was kind of like a bar band, you know, and, and, and like you said, I mean, it was a five piece band, more people, more problems. And that all kind of came to a head. Uh, concurrently, I was working at an opera house in Brooklyn and I met Erica and like this place was like working in a crab boat. So, you know, like you basically had to like shove your personality deep inside you <laughs> and, and go up and go to work and make money. You know? yeah. But, yeah, but like union the, stage hand. Yeah. But the longer we the longer we got to know each other, the more we realized that we were kindred spirits. And, you know, at the time, Jeremy and I were trying to get together something else. And we were playing around with a bunch of other musicians uh, who all went on to form and join great bands. Um, and. I was like, gee, and and like Erica and I, we were sound engineers. So we, you know, be setting up for a a show and it was time to, you know, check some, some instruments. So I'd, I'd hop on the drums and she'd, you know, pick up the bass and start singing, you know? So we finally were like, you know, we should really try playing music together. And it all just kind of worked out. Yeah. He asked me to jam with them and like, so, you know, December, 2014, December, October, 2014. Yeah. And, you know, right away, it seemed like we could definitely do something. That was great. I mean, together is one thing, kind of getting a feel for each other musically. On the dawn. I think you guys are coming in. right away. But how do you guys come up with a sound after that? You know, just jamming on some songs. Where do you say, hey, you know, we want the band to sound like this. We want to go in this direction. Because I think you guys kind of got a little bit of the best of everything old and a lot of the good stuff of all the good new bands 
and you kind of threw it into a blender and, and you came out with a pretty unique sound that's brutally heavy in some spots, yet it's like, you know, accessible in others. I mean, how did you come up with the, the, you know, the sound of the band? Well, Jeremy's uh, influenced by pop punk. He's got some love for that. I have love for garage rock outside of like the metal thing. And Nate is a really uh, big funk fan. So between like those outside influences, I think there's some, you know, there's some other stuff besides metal coming into the songwriting. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, also we, we all come from pretty different backgrounds. I mean, like Erica was in a, a kind of garage rock doom band on the West coast. Um, I played thrash and punk rock, you know, my whole upbringing. And then Jeremy kind of also played, you know, more, more pop punk, but also, you know, he, he tours with a black metal band. Um, and, uh, you know, so all that, all that kind of combined influence and all of our, you know, we just kind of write music we want to hear. And, you know, would you want to eat Italian food every day? You know, like, we don't want to just play Black Sabbath. I mean, songs. maybe Mike would. I, pr- I, I, pr- I, I pretty much do, so, yeah. <laughs> but I get what you're saying. <laughs> all right, that, that, uh, would you want to eat a hot dog? Dude? <laughs> you know? I'm like, that guy. Yeah, yeah. Would you want to eat a hot dog every day? You know, sometimes. Yeah, absolutely. Or a soup or. <laughs> So that's kind of how it all came about. Yeah, yeah and, it's, and it's great. First song really quickly, so it kind of like became obvious that we could do something quickly. Yeah. And then I think we also said to each other, we were like, "All right, three keys, stay that way because more people, more problems." Absolutely, I keep saying that to my wife in our marriage, but you know, I can't have one or two. So. <laughs> Yeah, you know, you're swinging, it's hard. I know, that's what I say, but you know, we'll get there one day, I hope, and we'll see what happens, but get, 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 get it back to the band. I mean, you've all been in bands before, you know what it's like getting this thing started, getting it off the ground, so you get together, yeah. you're doing this, you say to yourself, hey, you know, I remember my last band, we just, we put so much into it, it didn't go nowhere, or you go in there with a clear head and say, you know, we're going to take this as far as we can. It's a different music world today than it was in the 80s and in the 70s and even in the 90s. So, like, you know, how does the band get together and say, what are we going to do to make this a success? How are we going to get this thing to the next level? You know, it, we started off by self-releasing our first album. So for us, it's like when we came up with something we were satisfied with and we were like, oh, damn, we need to share this. We didn't wait for anybody to kind of go, hey, we love your band, you know, come, you know, do this or that. We put it out. And that made for a really cool um, beginning, I think. And ever since, we kind of don't wait. We do what we do when we want to do it, right? Like Metal Blade is a great label. They don't pressure us at all um, to, you know, run yeah i don't know run up a release schedule or whatever no yeah i mean like we are where we are by sheer luck i mean really to to to, to boil it down, like erica said we self-released you know and one day we woke up and in our email we have a shared email address that we all have access to and one day we had like 60 orders in germany and we're yeah like, what's this about it was when the internet was less algorithm based and yeah, more yeah. kind of open and people who were I mean they call it like truffle hunting at least in, in the journey yeah. but these truffle hunters so to speak <laughs> found our band yeah and I mean you like know? specifically there, there were a couple like key people who really kind of pushed us over the edge there was um um there was a, a guy who was an editor for a magazine called Deaf Forever, a German magazine. And he basically, a couple of days after we got all these German orders, we shipped them out. And we're like, oh, that was cool. And he came back and was like, hey, by the way, my name is Wolf. I, uh, 
I just wanted to give you guys a heads up. Uh, I love your band, and you guys are newcomer of the year on our on our magazine. Yeah, and I mean nice. from that point on, it really just kind of picked up. And he, that same guy Wolf Muleman, was really instrumental in us hooking up with our first label with Cruz del Sur with Enrico. Yeah, and um, you know it all just kind of built from there. Um, yeah. Yeah, the second record was on Cruz del Sur. Did you ever ask Enrico why did he name the record label after like a Spanish name in the from Italy? You know, good question. <laughs> that that, that, that would have been my first question. But that is a decent question. But you, definitely you know what? This Italian guy we'd never met was offering us money to make another record. So <laughs> really You're not going to ask no questions. Time. Just send me the check. <laughs> yeah, no problem. Yeah, we'll, we'll do that. <laughs> but you know it, it, the story's like a stepping stone story you self-release you go to Cruz del Sur from there you go to Metal Blade next it could be Atlantic it could be Sonic BMI you guys have you guys have that all going off here I mean the music is there I mean and what I love is that you know lyrically when you listen when you, when you read the lyrics to the songs they could be about anything there's social justice in there there's you know I guess some personal stuff and people read what they want into it you can write a song about one thing and ten different people you can get ten different meanings out of that song but it's a very socially well, active you know lyric yeah, well, that's that's the point. I mean, it's got to be universal in order for it to really grab people. I think you know the best lyrics are universal. Yeah, and also, I mean, at the at the end of it, we just write music we want to hear. You know, I mean, like it would be cool if there were more stepping stones beyond where we're at, and I mean, we're super happy with where we're at, so we'd be happy to just hang here for a while. But um, at the end of the day, it's, we we want to share music that we make that we like. Yeah. We had a great experience last May. We went um, to Europe supporting Ross the Boss, right? Yeah. And like that was one of the bigger tours that we've done. And I, I would say that, like, you know, definitely we are ready to do more of that. You know. Is it important to make connections with other bands that, you know, to help you along the way, or do you really just have to have like outside management or have somebody you know that can do the booking for you? Does it help to have other friends and bands that can kind of maybe help you along with the shows and getting on those tours? Yeah, it's actually critical, especially in the United States. There's a network of musicians that self-book, and so it's interesting. It's almost like you know asking people on dates. And you got to get them a year out and be like, hey, you want to run around with us for a couple of weeks? Yeah. You know, so, you know, this year we're planning some some runs with some friends. We got something with Lady Beast cooking. And, yeah, we're looking forward to hanging with some of the bands that we played with over 2023 again. That would be great. I know you got Blades of Steel coming yeah. up this August. That's going to be another great festival over in Wisconsin. Oh, forward to that big time well yeah we're also really excited that the u.s is starting or, or going back to you know what what they do what's more regular in europe and uh, having all these small regional festivals make it so much more accessible to get out and travel because you know you're going to play a show that's going to be well attended that you're going to sell merchandise out that you're going to meet other cool awesome bands and you can really plan a weekend around it you know absolutely you know the other thing i will say is that in new york area i'm seeing more and more bands skip the city proper and yeah. go to sayerville or out to you know long island i mean it's it's, it's interesting you know it is. You know, as a kid who grew up in Brooklyn, you know, and uh, had Lamore, which was like the rock venue back then in the day that I spent yep. my entire youth at, you know, it was great seeing Brooklyn kind of come back, you know, like five or six, seven years ago, like with Williamsburg and Greenpoint yep. and bed and Brownsville with all these, you know, clubs popping up over there. I, it felt nice to have them back again in a way. And COVID kind of closed a lot of them. Other ones had, you know, just started opening up again. I mean, do you find it harder now or did you find it harder a year or so ago trying to get onto shows because everybody in the mother was trying to play after COVID finally broke and bands were getting out there on the road, but now you had a band going out every night trying to play. Was it difficult trying to break into the back into the club scene again? Well, you know, we don't really play that much. And I mean, again, having Jeremy living seven plus hours away is, you know, makes it a little difficult to just kind of jump on a bill. But, um, you know, we, we've always been very strategic about our New York appearances because, I mean, it's like you said, there's always 
any given night of the week. There's a hundred different things to do. There's yeah. 10 different shows to go to. There's this, that, and the other. So we've always been really careful about what shows we play, who we're playing with, you know, et cetera. I mean, with our last record, we were really lucky in that we were able to book our own night with our own friends. We brought out-of-town bands into New York. And, you know, we played at St. Vitus, which has been an amazing home for us and for lots of other heavy metal bands. And, uh, you know, it did well. Um, so, I mean, I'm not, I'm not saying we're a headliner, but, you know, in New York, we, we tend to do okay. And yeah. I think that's a result of our, our being very choosy in our... Um, yeah, like we don't play every month. You know, we'll play like maybe once or twice a year, maybe. But isn't that important to kind of spread it out? Because if you play too often, you're like, oh, I just saw them last week to play it again. I'll catch them the next time. Then people start to lose interest. If you're making an event where, you know, yeah. like every couple of months you're going to play and, you know, you have other bands with you that are in the same category, you're going to get more people to come exactly. out. Exactly. Yeah. It's, it's definitely worked out really well for us. Yeah. And, that, like, you know, for example, we got the opportunity to go to Germany, like a bunch of times in 2019 and after the third time we went in that year we were like oh shit i think we maybe soaked this <laughs> market <laughs> you know what i mean yeah <laughs> but but, but, he, but they go crazy for this in europe <laughs> they love it over there they eat it up over there i mean they it's do. the way it is over there but is the way it used to be here in the 80s europe, yeah we would not talk to you right now Yeah. I think we lost each still other. There? Yeah, we're here. Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. We were saying, you know, we wouldn't be talking to you right now if it wasn't for the kids over there. Yeah. Like they really took the 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 ball and ran with it for us. You know what I mean? As a band, like momentum wise, um, we got very lucky to be able to go over there three times in 2019. Yeah. Well, you guys have been all over Europe pretty much. I mean, have you ever been to a country like it was like kind of like, a, like you kind of opened your eyes and said, wow, look at this. Like, you know, <laughs> what's going on here? Well, not really. I mean, you know, I would say that the most exotic place we've been is probably Budapest. Yeah. You know? Uh, and that was awesome. I mean, we even had a day off there, and it was like, you know, sightseeing heaven. But um, we would like to branch out into Southern Europe as well. So, you know, we do a lot of Germany. So I feel like I know a lot of Germany a lot better than I did. I should probably do some um, Duolingo German <laughs> studies at this <laughs> We know the important stuff, like Frischstuck and Alspar. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I do fire. Yeah. You know, that kind of shit. You have a light. Yeah. Well, speaking of playing other countries, you guys played Texas last year. Even though it's in the U.S., it's like another country. It kind of is, man. You know, during our Houston show, we had a power grid outage during the show. <laughs> Yeah, the venue lost power completely. The whole block lost power. It was like so Texas, you know. <laughs> it was awesome. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, it's very interesting. And, you know, I'm talking to like heads in Texas, they were like, you know what? We exist out of spite. <laughs> 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 but I respect the shit out of that. So. <laughs> oh, God. Yeah, it's a whole nother world down there. For sure, for sure. They don't put beans in their chili, man. I'm sure they don't. <laughs> they do. It's all meat. Uh, well, everything's bigger in Texas, you know. Hell yeah, you know, a lot of cows. Uh, but, 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 but I mean, you know, talking about like playing the shows, like maybe here in New York once or twice, you're getting on other shows. If you're not going to get yourselves on like a lengthy tour that goes out for a few weeks, where it's worth the time for everybody to kind of get together, because the locations are kind of far apart now. I mean, do you think it's yeah. better to like just give up on the one-off shows and maybe just do the festivals and wait for tours to come around? Because I know with tours, it can be hard. You got to buy on to some of them. You know, you got to have connections to get involved with it. Sometimes it costs you more money than you make. Yeah, I mean, like. The 
we're 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 not rich kids. You know, we can't afford to buy on uh, any cool tours. <laughs> you know, so that's that's out. As the you know, um, the yeah. other thing is like a lot of a lot of the bigger touring uh, booking agents and stuff. They they rely on management companies, and we're we've always been kind of self management managed. It's not that we're against management companies; it's that nobody's really approached us, and nobody's really given us any offers or any opportunities there. So you know, we we are not as you know as as palatable to some of the bigger agencies. And um, you know, as far as the time, I mean, it's less about not being able to take the time. We all kind of have designed our lives in one way or another around being able to, you know, go at a moment's notice, you know, like if if Judas Priest called and said, Hey, come on tour, we'd do it immediately. It would be a drop every you know. (laughs) But what you were saying about the distances is true. And I mean a lot of the tour routing and stuff is isn't what it used to be, you know. Some some tours, you know, if you end up bus chasing, you know, if you're an opening, opening, opening act, you know, your chances are you're not on the tour bus. You're you're in a van behind the tour bus, yeah. you know, doing all these things. in a parking lot every yeah. night. You exactly. Know, exactly. So, I mean, like, we're, again, we're game for all of it, you know, if it makes sense. But um, it, it's definitely gotten harder in the U.S. And, and back to what we were saying before, those small festivals yeah. really make it easy to do a small to do a long weekend you know they really make it easy to to take those kind of risks because you know that those people are are going to give it their all you're not dealing with live nation like you're dealing with some guy you know who put this together because he loves it yeah. and is and is working really hard to keep which it is also frankly the case for the bigger festivals as well because like in europe a lot of those well-known festivals like Keep It True and Hell Over Hammerberg and stuff like that, not the Vakins, but the sort of lower tier yeah. of that stuff. I mean, those things are put on by like one or two people. You know what I mean? Headbangers so, open air. It's yeah. like a guy. It's a lot so, of work and a lot of yeah. money they lay out to make these shows happen. I mean, a lot of they take or, big losses, or, some of them. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Sure. So, yeah, I mean, got to give it to those people that are, are doing uh, the work to bring us together to make it viable to bring us together, you sure. know, definitely. Well, when you guys yeah. are out we touring and, you, and you're driving around in the van from place to place together, who's the one that gets on the yeah. person's nerves the most first? Sorry, what was that? Who gets as on as, everybody's nerves? Yeah, who's the first person to get on each other's who's nerves when you're driving together in a van? Uh, we're, um, we're an equal opportunity. Yeah. Right? <laughs> we, uh, we hate each other equally three ways. Well, you know what they say. Familiarity breeds contempt. So, you know, we're, but, we're, we're just I will here. say this. I am relegated to sleeping with Nate every night because apparently we snore. Oh, okay. Yeah. And just handle that. So <laughs> Maybe he just says that and we can get his own room. Well, that's exactly what happened. it happens. <laughs> you know, no, we're, listen, when you're when you're in a band with people for ten years, I mean, we're going on ten years now. Yeah, September, yeah. October. Little no, you have to you have to make it comfortable for everybody, or else it's like. And, and also, you need to you need to be understanding. And yeah. Listen, like, yeah, we all get on each other's nerves all the time over like the most asinine BS. But like, <laughs> at the end of the day, what really matters is the fact that when we all get into a room together. We play really cool music, and we have a really good time doing it. So we, we're we're always really cognizant of that, and and you know, be be nice to each other. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, I've a lot of bands, and I am, you know, a little bit older than these guys. And I will say this: like once I started playing with them, I was like, shit, this is what most musicians look for in a lifetime. Because the way that we write together is so fluid and the language that we've created. So whatever happens externally, like with the band, we are on fire (laughs) with each other. You know what I mean? And that's important. I mean, when, when if you go back to the beginning and you you know you're working together for the first time as a three piece, trying to compose songs and put them together. I mean, do you remember the first song you guys wrote together where you looked at each other and said, "Yeah, you know, we got something going on here." Absolutely. Yeah, it's the first song on our first record, right? Yeah. Song. I mean, and that came up quick, man. I mean, yeah. that was like within the first 
one or two times that we were in a room together. And at the time that we met, Nate was working at a backline rental house. So we were rehearsing at said backline rental house with our, you know, fantasy gear. Fantasy gear, like really two fucking full SPTs and like all the craziness. You know, and so it was really fun. It was really fun, yeah. And it continues to be. So we went straight to fantasy and came up with some cool shit. Yeah. That's great. I know you're working on new music right now. I don't know if we're going to get it to this year yeah. or next year. I mean, you're still going to be with Metal Blade. Is it still a deal in place? Are you going to look to shopping around? How's mm-hmm. that going to work? So we, uh, we've been in talks with the label. We're there planning on putting album and we're super excited to be working with them again i mean metal blade is a machine they've been around a long time they know what they're doing and it was a really awesome opportunity for us you know because we don't know nothing from nobody you know to have yeah. to have you know andreas our and our guy in our corner telling us the next step you know preparing us for this i mean the onslaught of interviews and, and yeah other they, stuff. they are it, it, it's really different working with uh company that has multiple employees you kind of have to learn sort of the workflow of the the company in a way whereas like Enrico one guy you know but he does become overwhelmed sometimes and I know that like with each he puts his heart and soul into it you know so if he's busy with something else, he maybe can't like help you with some other shit. Yeah. And yeah. and back to your question. I mean, we're, we're shooting for this year, but I mean, sometimes it makes sense to wait. You know, sometimes if there's a really good tour on the table and you want to use that uh, that momentum to put out your record and, and you know, it, it's all connected, especially when you're at our level. You know, like we're not we're not making a living doing it. We're doing this because we want to, yes. but we also need to be smart about it and not, you know, lose our shirts in the process. Yeah, it's like if we're going to take, you know, a month off of work, we need to know that it's not going to be some bullshit. Absolutely, yeah, sure, I don't blame you. Well, I mean, you know, you look at Metal Blade, they've been around <laughs> since 82, they were one of the first labels to come out of the underground scene back then, along with Megaforce over here on, on the on the East Coast on our side. You know, Brian Slagle's still involved with it, still doing it, and the best thing is that you can get free tickets to his hockey games when because he, he owns a team. Oh, wow. Oh, does he own the Vegas team? He owns the team. I don't know if it's the Vegas team anymore. I don't know which one he owns. He did it. He did have a stake in it, but oh. he does own the hockey team. So tell him, listen, that? where's my free tickets? Is that a perk of being part of the company? It's like the, uh, you know, know, like the Christmas party. Every day. I didn't know that, but the guy that makes all our videos is an NHL employee. He's a videographer for the NHL. And so, I don't know. You know, maybe we could... Uh, put them together and come up with some kind of metal blade. Uh, I don't know. I'll reach, out to, I'll reach out to Brian. I tell him, what the hell are you doing with these guys? You're not getting them tickets to the games. You're letting them hang in the loop. Come on. You got to get a snap up over here. What are you doing? <laughs> Islander, man. I'll Islander. get right on the phone when I'm after this interview. I'll straighten them right out. You don't know, worry about I, it. Kate and I work at the arena that the Islanders play in. Well, that they or that to. they used to play in. Right? The one in Brooklyn, yeah. the Barclays Center. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. But who does any hockey? Have? No, the hockey's done there. Um, now, now they play at uh, UBS. Yeah, it's just basketball no. there right now. Yeah, that's a nice oh, arena yeah. they put over there. Madonna's getting sued by two gay guys because they started. She started the show late and they missed the bus going home. So she's they're suing her for like millions uh, of dollars. <laughs> they're bummed out. Listen, yeah. Madonna did a, a one month sit down at another venue that Erica and I work at and regularly, you know, she would start, you know, the show was supposed to start at eight and she'd start at 1 a.m. You're fucking kidding. You know, at yeah, a she... union venue. Can you yeah. imagine how much the, <laughs> the overtime. That? <laughs> yeah, that's crazy. Like, that's Madonna crazy. is like the honey badger of fucking. <laughs> <laughs> And but that that but that's on her. She's got to pay the she's got to pay the difference. But you know what it is? I think she was hanging out with well, she was hanging out with Axel from Guns N' Roses for too long, and she got into the habit of coming on nine hours after the showtime starts. Hey, well, she can afford it, you know. Yeah. I'm sure I, they'll settle out of court. I yeah. must have I must have yeah. walked out of three Guns N' Roses concerts in the eighties because I was sitting there for like five hours waiting for Axel to decide it's time to come on and play. 
Yeah, I remember that. Uh, Meadowlands, right? Yep. <laughs> that was one of them. Yep. That's so. I, I remember, like, what the fuck's wrong with this guy? <laughs> He's too high. Throw some water on him. Yeah. Well, listen, no, people, yeah. we will never do that to you, no matter how big we get, all right? <laughs> not, not at all. We are ever grateful. <laughs> Well, yeah. that's great to know. But, hey, guys, I'm going to let you go in two minutes because I have another guest waiting in the wings to come on, and I want to play some songs off the albums awesome. and everything get down there. But do you have anything planned for this year that you know of right now in, in the New York area or even New Jersey? Uh, well, um, we are trying to work on a tour with Bloodstar. Oh, they're great. Trying to get out to the East Coast. So look for that towards the end of the summer yeah i mean aside from that we, we don't have any concrete plans but we yeah. we plan on playing in the city and in the tri-state area uh around the summertime uh you know the hope is have an album coming out later this year but uh you know we, we're recording next month so uh, we'll let you know yeah, yeah that's yeah, fantastic yeah. Oh. Right well now. when you're back down in the city we're gonna get together and uh the drinks are on me excellent well Thanks. mike Nice to meet you, man. Thank Erica you and Nate, it was us. my pleasure, man. You guys have a great day and take care. All right, it's been fun. Thank you. You too. Bye bye. All right, let's get on some more music from Sanhedrin. Let me see what we can do right here. I played with uh, Kurt wanted to hear. How about we do Heroes End? <laughs>
Man, I absolutely love this band. I can't wait for this new record to come out. All right, we're going to do one more set of music, and then we're going to get to Steve Mann from Lionheart and the Michael Shanker group. They got a brand new record out, too. Everybody has a brand new record out. Every year, it just keeps getting better and better and better, and the quality albums, too. The new Ruthless record came out last week. You know, we had them on the show right before we wrapped up before the holidays. We had Sammy on here and Sandy. Uh, what a great album. If you haven't picked it up, go grab yourself a copy of it. It's just amazing. All right, how about we do Warhead? You remember Warhead, the New York band? Had Tom on the show, I think, about eight years ago, maybe a little more than that. Cult Metal Classics released all their old stuff in 2017. They've got more stuff that's going to be released right now, so Tom is working on putting it together. He sent me over all the instrumental tracks of what's about to come, uh, and they have a couple of singers in mind and pretty well-known people that I think are going to be happy to see uh, on the, if they get them singing these songs. So this is an instrumental, but this is what's coming on the new Warhead. Just picture it with vocals by probably one of my favorite guests who we've had on the show probably over a dozen times. Times to give you a little hint. Here you go, Warhead, the dead amongst us. <laughs>
Starks, Black Lace. Man, I had such a crush on Marianne Scandifo back in the 80s. And who would think 40 years later, she's one of my besties we talk all the time. Uh, what a strange world we live in, huh? All right, we're going to get to Steve Man from Lionheart in a few minutes. Let's play something off the brand new record, The Grace of the Dragon Flight. It's a concept record based around World War II. They did an amazing job on this. This is coming back, you know, I think it was 2016 they made that comeback. And they've just done an amazing job putting out albums ever since that time. So let's get V's for victory. We'll talk to Steve right after that, play another track, and probably wrap it up the show right after that. So here you go.
Mike. I'm very well, thank you. How are you? Oh, it's great to talk to you. Good morning. I should say good afternoon. <laughs> You're in a different time uh, zone than me. Good afternoon. Yeah, we're three o'clock in the afternoon. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right, well, listen, it's a pleasure to talk to you. And being such a big fan of Lionheart and MSG and everything you've done, I'm thrilled that, you know, Lionheart's got a new record out and we didn't have to wait like 20 years for it. <laughs> uh, we're pretty thrilled about it too, actually, I have to say. Uh, you know, the Lionheart that we have today that reunited back in 2016, it's yeah. a different Lionheart than we had in 1985. Even though it's the same uh, members, musically, I mean, it's a different Lionheart. Uh, it, it is. I mean, the, the difference basically is that we, uh, I mean, in the last 35 years or so, we've, we've matured a lot as uh, songwriters, as musicians, um, as people. Um, and I think that, that just, it gives you a different view of how you want to, uh, to, to create the music. And, you know, when we did the Hot Tonight album back in uh, 1984, uh, in Los Angeles, I think our kind of you know aims and aspirations were very different from um, you know from how we see things now. And I think we've become a lot more uh, thoughtful, a lot deeper in the way we do music these days. Um, you know, back in the in the mid '80s, we wanted the success and we wanted to hit record, and uh, you know we were kind of really going for it and trying to work with the business as it was at the time. I think what's a lot more important for us these days is that we're now concentrating a lot more on doing the music that we like, um, which is, you know, basic um, melodic rock with harmony guitars and, and three-part lead vocals, uh, three-part backing vocals, you know, which is what really constitutes the Lionheart sound. So um, I think it's just, you know, over the, the decades, we have changed so much as people that, of course, the music changes with it. And it shows. But do you think that a lot of that pressure, I know like you just mentioned, you know, you were trying to go along with the label and the music industry. Mm -hmm. Do you think industry, at least back in the 70s and 80s, has so much control over the output of a band that a band would actually change its whole style, sound, and being to like have that success or make it on that label? Uh, you mean back in the 80s? Yeah, back in the 80s, yeah. Um, absolutely. That, that was the problem. Everything revolved around getting that record deal. You couldn't, you know, as a band, you couldn't really... Uh, begin to think about, <clears throat> excuse me, doing anything um, worthwhile in terms of recording an album or even touring unless you had the support of a record company. And that's the only way that you could then raise the finance in order to go into the studio to put the album down. Um, you know, so we were the same as uh, most other bands of the time, that we were looking for that all elusive record deal. And um, we got together in 1980, end of 1980, and it took us until 1984 before we, we managed to secure the deal. And in that um, in-between time, all we did was just write songs. You know, we just used to meet up every day uh, in our rehearsal room, write songs, and that's all we could do. And, um, you know, so of course, yeah, you know, going for that all-elusive record deal was the, was the thing to do. And if it meant changing the, your style accordingly, to something that you thought a record company would want to hear from you, then that's what you did. And unfortunately, you know, it was you had to mold yourself a lot more back in those days to how the how the business was than you than you do now. A, a lot of bands have done that over the years, and even bands who have already hit like a height, like Judas Priest and bands like that, and even Ozzy Osbourne in the late '80s when the glam metal and the pop metal became more popular, they even started to change their sound and style to kind of fit in what was going on to keep that record label giving them the money and and it stayed successful, but as a musician and as an artist, how far do you go? How far are you willing to bend on a sound that you you know you created to accommodate a label? Is there like a, a fine line, or do you just go all in? Um, it, you don't go all the way because you get to the point where you know you start changing your sound so much that you're not really enjoying what you're doing anymore, and that's absolutely pointless. You might just as well go out and get a job as a chartered accountant. <laughs> yeah. um, you know, so so basically. Uh, yeah, we, we tailored our sound. We had a manager at the time who said, you know, you've got to go to America. Uh, you've got to sound more American, use an American producer, which we did, which was Kevin Beamish. And um, so, you know, we I think we went as far as we felt we could go as a, a British band that had developed out of the new wave of British heavy metal. You know, done a bit of a Death Leopard, gone a bit American and... and um, and I think we were kind of, I suppose, looking for success in America as opposed to, to back in Britain. And I think that came back to bite us because 
uh, same as with Leopard, I think a lot of our fans at the time in Britain felt that we were selling out. Uh, and we probably were. You know, we were probably so desperate to get that deal that we did s sell out. Uh, we felt that we hadn't gone too far with our change in style. But I think looking back on it now, I think we probably did. Um, and that most and that's probably contributes a little bit to why Lionheart now is so different to Lionheart back then. Because Lionheart now is doing the music that comes straight from our heart. Back then it was, yeah, we were shifting our direction a little bit. You know, going even back to the original lineup and the reunited lineup, which is mostly the same members, one or two changes in, in the lineup and personnel, one thing they always threw at you with Lionheart was that it's a super group. And, you know, the pedigree of the members, the bands they came from, the bands they played, and the music they wrote. Do you think that's kind of like a lot to live up to when people say that? Because you don't really get that chance to start as a new band and build up that audience that's like, well, look at where these guys came from. We're really expecting this from them. Uh, no, not really, you know, because we feel that we, you know, we, we've all worked very, very hard. And whether it's with Lionheart or whether it's with other bands that we've been in, um, you know, we, we've all started from the ground up. We've all played the pubs where 25 people and the dog turned up. And, you know, we, we've, we've really kind of done our groundwork. Uh, and so whether we got to that point, um, you know, where we had the experience and our names were starting to get a bit known, whether that was within Lionheart or any other band, it didn't really matter. So we didn't really feel the need to go back to square one. Uh, Dennis had obviously come from, from Iron Maiden, so that gave us a little bit of a, um, uh, a raising of our profile. Uh, but yeah, we, you know, we were uh, dubbed by Sounds Magazine in, in England, the, the first new wave of uh, British heavy metal supergroup. Uh, and we laughed at that. You know, we thought, well, we're not really, we're just a band, you know. Uh, but you know, I don't think it ever affected the, the way we played or you know how we felt about ourselves. We just felt that you know we, we were a band with a bit of experience behind us, and we were using that experience to to create the Lionheart sound. And what a great job you've done of that! You know, since Second Nature Thank came you. out, and then the Reality of Miracles, and now this amazing new record, The Grace of the Dragonfly. I mean, the progression in songwriting and, and, and lyric and themes is just unbelievable, especially on this new record. It's a concept record about about World War Two and about war in general. I mean, when you wrote this record years ago, I guess we started like after the last record and around the co time COVID kind of broke out. But since that time, we've always had war in this world in one form or another, but things have really gone to hell over the last couple of years with mm. all these countries going at it with each other. This record couldn't be more appropriate for the time, I think. Um, it, it, it's funny because, uh, as you say, when we started the album, we started writing as soon as uh, the, uh, the Reality of Miracles had, had come out and we'd done the promotion, we started writing for the new album. And, you know, the... the, the I mean, obviously, there's wars all the time, but you know, there were no major wars. Uh, this is before the the Ukraine invasion and before uh, what's happening in Gaza, and um, it wasn't because of the world situation that we started writing it. You know, we we just it, it, I think Lee has a uh, Lee Small, the singer, has a uh, you know quite a fascination with World War Two, and he has a lot of memorabilia from that period. And so uh, I came up with the idea of you know let's develop things within Lionheart now and let's see if we can try a concept album or at least a themed album uh, and so Lee took that chance to um, I think to express his his interest in World War Two, and of course you know then the, the the major conflict started in Ukraine and Gaza and now as the album comes out you're absolutely correct uh, it's a very very uh, appropriate time I think for an album like this to come out and our sentiments um, when we started the album, are the same as they are now, which is that war is not the way. You know, we, we really, really wanted to to stress the fact that, um, you know, what war is no way to solve anything. You know, it's started by people who don't have to fight it. It's the, it's the you know, the, the innocent civilians who have to go out there and fight at the front line. And, and you know, and it's, it's not the way to, to solve things. Um, you know, we have our... Uh, problem people around the world, you know, our dictators, and of course they have to be kept in check, and sometimes it's, it's unavoidable. But you know, our sentiment basically behind all of this is that uh, it, it's not the way, and, and, and things have to change. Yeah, people really need to pay attention to the lyrics on this album and the story that's being told because it's not about kill, bomb, and destroy. It's about the aftermath and, and everything that goes on and people that they deal with during the course of a war. And when I when I listen to this album, I mean, it's almost like listening to a book on audio in a way. 
Well, how does the whole concept of a concept album come about? Because you want it to be a flow from song to song telling that story, but yet you also want every song to kind of stand apart from itself so it can be used as an individual song where people don't have to kind of follow along with it and just enjoy the song itself. Is the music come first? Does the story come first? Is it one at a time? How does it work? It's a very, it's a very difficult balance. I mean, this is the first concept album I've done. Um, and it's a very difficult balancing act. I mean, because we, you're, you're quite correct. You end up with a whole bunch of songs, uh, each of which, which has a, a different uh, feel or a different thought behind it. And you end up with these songs that um, have a, a very logical chronological order. You know, so songs like V is for Victory would come at the end and, um, you know, Woman's War may come kind of in the middle somewhere. And they, they kind of dictate by the lyrics where they should come in the chronological order. But then you have the problem that you, you, you don't place the album musically. Um, so I had to make a decision as a producer of the album. Um, do I actually make it pace um, nicely, but we might get things out of order? Or do we put everything in the chronological order? And in the end, I decided on the musical side of it, because I think that it doesn't really matter if things change uh, around in, in timing so that they're kind of in a, in a different chronological order. I mean, very often you go and see a film, um, you know, that, uh, that will start in the future and then give you the conclusion of the film first. I mean, like, you know, Lawrence of Arabia or, you know, yeah. many other films do the same thing. And then they go back in time to the beginning. And I thought, actually, there's no, there's no real reason to kind of do the obvious thing here and do a chronological order as how you, you know, would experience a war from, from beginning to end. Uh, so I, I made the decision to, to concentrate on the music and to make sure that that was paced nicely through the album um, and let people kind of, you know, jump to the end of the war and then back to the beginning and then to the middle. And uh, I, I think only one person so far has said to me, why is it all out of order? And I explained what I just explained to you, and they were quite happy. So I, I think, you know, we kind of got away with it in that sense. Um, but just to expand on what you were saying also in the question, um, it's, uh, it's a very sensitive subject. And, you know, it's something that we, we, we were very careful about because obviously we have um, a lot of people in, you know, Japan and Germany who, um, who, who love the band. And so we wanted to kind of, even though it was based around, you know, the, the allies in, um, in World War II and in particular Britain, obviously, because we come from Britain, you know, we wanted to make it applicable to, to everybody in the whole world. And we really wanted to, to concentrate on the humane side of things, you know, how it affected individual people. You've got uh, songs like Just a Man, which is one of my favorite songs lyrically. Um, where and I think this is a story that may have actually happened. I think it was based on a true story, you know, where two foes in the war, then after the war finished, then became absolute firm friends uh, and met af afterwards. And and these kind of stories, you know, for us, really emphasise the fact that you know it's a war between dictators or, or world leaders. It's not a war between uh, individuals, you know. And uh, there's the great story of. In World War One, of the um, at Christmas time, the the you had the British front line and the German front line, and they called a truce for one day. I remember <laughs> that, yeah. Football, yeah, they played football together and they shook each other's hands, wished each other Merry Christmas, and then on on the day after Christmas, they started blowing each other's brains out again. It's ridiculous and it's it makes absolutely no sense. Well, that's that's the whole concept of war, I guess. None of it ever makes sense in the end. Okay. I mean, when we talk about the music on this record, I mean. Did the idea come first, and then you say, hey, you know what, let's put some music together for this? Did you specifically write, saying, here's what the theme of this you know, story is going to be? So I, in my mind, musically, I want it to sound like this. Or did you just have songs already written you know, as you were working on them for the new record, and say, I could alter them to fit in, or we're just going to make the lyrics fit into the music that I already have? Um, yeah, Lee and I have a very, very good working partnership as a songwriting team, and we seem to kind of be able to telepathically know what the other one is thinking about. <laughs> and um, so once we decided to do a concept album and, and to do it about World War II, uh, I just went ahead and, and started, the way we write is I write a backing track and then send it to Lee. Uh, and he puts his, his stuff over the top and then sends it back to me. And we go back and forth a couple of times before we end up with the final arrangement. Um, but I think having 
got that vibe from Lee that this was about the Second World War, I definitely had that in the back of my mind when I was writing the tracks. Uh, so yes, it was an influence. And, um, and Lee always said to me that uh, he finds it difficult to just sit down and write a melody or lyrics without some kind of inspiration. And, uh, and that inspiration for him came when I sent him the backing track. So, you know, thing, you can try and work with some singers sometimes and work the same way. And, it, you know, it, it either works quite well or it doesn't work so well. But with Lee, as I say, we had this kind of telepathic communication when we were writing. And, uh, you know, so I think it's, uh, yeah, I think to answer your question, it's, it, it, there was a deliberate feel or thought in my mind uh, to kind of have some kind of Second World War atmosphere or element behind the uh, behind, behind the tracks um, it, before I sent them to Lee, and then Lee used that as his inspiration. Do you think if another story came about that kind of interest you, you would do this again, put another album out like this, another concept record from start to finish? I think it would very much depend on the concept. If it was something that we felt strongly about, then then yes. I mean, my my thought on this album was. It would be fun to do a concept album because it takes Lionheart one step further, and I've never done a concept album before, so let's give it a try. Um, Lee's reasoning was that it was a great vehicle for him to express himself, you know, with his interest in the in the Second World War. Um, so I think if there was a, a a concept that we both felt, uh, yeah, that's really really well worth writing a concept about, I, I have no idea what it would be. Then I think we would do it again. I think it's. It, it helps to kind of unify an album uh, and bring it all together. And I like that idea. I love things like War of the Worlds from Jeff Wayne and, um, you know, these, these stories uh, that develop from the beginning uh, of the album to the, to the end of the album. And it's, it's you know, a con- the concept album is something that kind of very much came up in the 70s and was very popular back then. It's not so popular these days. And uh, I, I, think it's, I think it's really nice because it forces... Uh, streamers you know that will just pick out songs on at random uh, on spotify it would force them to actually listen to the album from beginning to end and, um, and, and there's not enough of that these days so you know i yeah i think we would we would definitely do another one uh that would be great i mean considering that it's only january and the album comes out officially i get you know next month on the 23rd of february i mean to me this is like already in my top 10 for the year and and we haven't got you got through the last 11 months yet it's just that strong. It's just that strong of an album, and in the music yeah. industry, it's always good to be busy. I mean, because you can really have a lot of downtime, and that's not good for a musician. Between your studio work, your engineering work, MSG, and everything else you do, and Lionheart, all the guys in the band are in other projects. They're all in other bands. They're all very busy. How do you make Lionheart work as a live act? I mean, do you really have to sit down and kind of plan it around everything else to get it on the road? Yeah, I mean, that, that's the only way you can do it. You know, we. we um... But we would love to have gone out and done more more gigs, um, you know. But we are all very very busy with other projects, and that's why the album's taken three years to uh, to complete. Uh, you know, not because we kind of lost interest, or I mean, there was one point where um, we we did actually take a break because it was all getting a bit close to us. But um, the main reason why it took so long is it's just actually finding the time to sit in the studio and to spend a few days working on Lionheart. And that's the same reason why we haven't really been out on the road much. Uh, we are doing uh, Firefest in Manchester in October in the UK. Uh, that's October the 11th. That's later this year. Um, and we're hoping to, to build some, some gigs around that, you know, which would be really nice. So, you know, I think MSG are not doing, so far, are not doing a huge amount this year uh, of live work. So, you know, we can maybe... Um, start to think about filling in the gaps with, with some Lionheart shows. We'd love to do some shows. We really would. Uh, so maybe we can get that together this year. That would be great. I mean, MSG, you know, definitely keeps you busy. Michael's always yeah. out on the road touring, and I'm sure something's going to pop up sooner or later this year with that also. <laughs> and I know COVID kind of put a hold on everything for everybody for a good two years, and getting over that was a long time coming. Do you see the music scene picking up and getting better with, like you know, before COVID, people were still going out to shows. After COVID, things just changed. I mean, a lot of clubs closed down, a lot of venues weren't there anymore. It made it much harder for musicians. And then all of a sudden, when it did clear up, everybody was on the road touring. You'd have five or six, seven acts coming through in one week, and people really had to start picking and choosing. Then the economy tanked all over the world, making it even more difficult. I mean, so do you see it getting a little better now than it was maybe two or three years ago, or right before COVID? I, I think so. I mean, the, you know, when we we did the first um, tour with MSG after COVID, 
Uh, and we were thinking, uh, you know, are people actually going to turn up now? You know, they've got so used to, you know, they've had two, three years of sitting at home watching bands on YouTube. Are they going to really be bothered getting up and, and going out and, and going to gigs again? And we were really surprised. We, we basically, our, our tour was sold out. Um, we did an American tour, we did a European tour, and all the shows were, were either sold out or nearly sold out. So people seem to be going back to the shows. Um, obviously, every every band and his aunt were going out touring because uh, there were so many postponed shows uh, from 2021 or 2020, whatever it was that COVID, COVID put pay to everything. Uh, so everybody was catching up, you know, and all of the, the festivals had actually booked, you know, they're putting lineups on that are booked back in 2020 uh so i i think it's i think it's kind of picking up i mean i i certainly haven't seen any signs of people not going out to shows i think the problem has been local promoters have, have been very fearful uh that if they put on a show people they're not going to sell tickets and hopefully that's now kind of actually um they're getting over that point uh, and I think they're starting to realize that people actually do want to go to shows. So what I've seen, and I'm no kind of, you know, I haven't really been monitoring the situation that much, but from what I've seen and from what I've experienced on tour, it does seem to be picking up again. And I think, you know, things are, are probably getting back towards a reasonably healthy live scene again. That's great. You know, like you said earlier, you know, uh, with the internet and people watching stuff on YouTube during COVID and not going out, we, we really couldn't for a lot of places. But I noticed it's a generational thing. Where I come from the 60s and 70s and 80s where, you know, going to a live show was the be all the end all. That's where you wanted to be. You wanted to see a new band live that you never heard before to discover the music or you wanted to see one of your favorites that you've been buying their albums over the years. And that's just the way it was and it still is for me today. But it seems like the younger generation now, they've become so accustomed to getting everything through the computer, through the internet, their music, their mm-hmm. videos. They would rather watch a concert on the internet than actually stand in an audience where, you know, everything's right there in your face for you. And I worry about what's going to happen when, like, my generation, our generation kind of, like, you know, moves on. And what's going to happen mm-hmm. to the younger one? Will, will everything go virtual? Like, Kiss is going to go virtual now and be avatars after mm-hmm. they retired and ABBA did it. And, you know, a lot of bands, it seems like that might be the future of live music, if you want to call it live. <laughs> I mean, yeah, is it <clears throat> is it really live if you're a hologram? I mean, it's, you know, <laughs> I, I don't know. I, 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 it's, it's a very difficult question. You know, I mean, you know, a lot of the, the, the whole atmosphere of actually going out to see a live band is like the cinema experience, you know, where you're, you're one person in amongst a whole load of people. So, of course, you get this atmosphere of a live audience. But if you're watching a hologram, you know, it, is that really... A live experience you know i i mean my i would never want to do that i mean if i got to the point where i was physically unable to tour anymore um then i would say okay that's the end of it you know i i would not even consider sending out a hologram to to play in my place um i would think i would rather people just watch youtube videos of past performances you know i just think it's um you get to a point where if you can't do it anymore, then don't do it. You know, it's it's um, just stick to recording albums, and you can have a you know nice early night every night and, <coughs> and work during the day. Um, it's a very difficult question. I mean, it, you know, I, that's how I would feel, but I'm not saying it's wrong. You know, if there's people that are quite happy to uh, to perform as a hologram, uh, you know, or a band may you know may present a hologram of a missing band member like Queen with Freddie Mercury. Uh, you know, if the I suppose at the end of the day, if the audience are happy with that, then that's all that really matters. Um, so, uh, but I don't think I'd do that myself. I'm glad they had that, Steve. I'm not going to keep. I know you have a whole bunch of interviews to do today. I think I was one of the first ones, so I'm going to give you a little break between now and the next one. Such oh, a big, okay. such a big fan of your music and everything you've done over the years. The Grace of the Dragonfly, definitely one of the best albums of the year. One of the best I think of Lionheart's career, and that's saying a lot considering how good all the other albums are. I mean, I can't wait for another two or three years to go by because I know we're going to get another album from you guys. And hopefully you can make it here to America, to New York, on the East Coast. I would love to see you guys live. That would be fantastic. And you can take me out for a coffee when we get there. I will do. Okay. <laughs> it's been great to talk to you, Mike. And thank you very much for your kind comments. That's, uh, that's really appreciated. You too, Steve. Have a great night. Take care, my friend. Yeah. You too, Mike. Bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>
to thank all my guests. I want to thank Eric and Nate from Sanhedrin. I want to thank Steve Mann from Lionheart. That's a great new record they have out. Pick it up if you haven't already. And stick around because we're going to get brand new Sanhedrin this year. I'm looking forward to that also. Next week, we're wrapping up January with Child's Play and Spillage. We got all our guests lined up pretty much for February right now. We have, I believe, Biff Byford is on the show. David Rock Feinstein from The Rods. We have Morbid Saint on the show. Uh, who else do we have? Traveler and a few other bands that have releases coming out next month. So we'll be posting the February schedule next week after next weekend show. But I want to wish everybody a great week. Have a great night. Which left of it for you guys is almost on here for me on a Sunday. We're going to wrap it up with Thruster, MIA, Screams of Pain. Take care, everybody. Have a great week. I'll see you next Sunday night.